historical overview, you may agree or not, very cultural uh, driven. Uh, try to pinpoint uh, some of uh, uh, the passionate causes that has moved us in the past uh, 20 years. So I'm going back before crypto. Actually, I'm going back to uh, 1980. And then I'll try to give you um, an opinion about where we are going. What are the challenges for activists? And when I'm talking about activists, I'm talking about people that are exposing even themselves, their privacy, they are, they, they are risking to obtain something for a higher cause of the community and of the society around them. They are fighting injustice. And uh, yeah, I, have, I come up with some examples. If you can, yes. Grazie, per George. And it should be there somewhere uh, in the white uh, thing. But uh, yeah, it's your computer, right? So I will also try to live install some malworms on your computer while I talk, just to <laughs> have a glance. No. You put them there, they, they were there. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, one, uh, uh, one thing that I like to introduce is what we do at Dine, but just very briefly, but where we come from, cheers. Uh, this is like, uh, like what we do. It's, it's a lot of different things and, and we have fun mixing them. So we use art a lot as, as a communication medium. Uh, designers engaged with economists, with programmers. We are hackers. We like to hack ourselves also in our beliefs and you know, cross boundaries. So privacy was always a very big uh, topic for us. Uh, we come also, many of us come from the South Italian networks. Many of us have been involved in grassroots anti-mafia movements in Sicily. So we know that uh, privacy is very important. When you have uh, mafiosi tracking you down, your face on the street, when you have like a government like the ones we had in Italy in the last 20 years, then you need privacy really. Um, one thing that I focus on, myself and my colleagues, in the past uh, 10 years is the sovereignty on algorithms. It was mentioned by some people on the stage already. It's important that people understand the algorithms that are governing their digital life. This is a basic right. I will define it natural or civil. Uh, it's like democracy. We have to decide on our laws. We have a democratic process. Algorithms are law, as code was law, Lessig already declared long ago. So we need to have a say about it. So, as a developer, I like to say that when we are participating in a software, we are all participants. And there are bright examples of this software. Uh, in crypto, there are many because we have like uh, improvement proposals. This is a great practice that uh, Bitcoin started and everyone picked up. Uh, you have projects like Tor that have like a discussion about what is going to be changed and so on and so forth. So algorithmic sovereignty is a very important trait in a software. I'm over open source. Of course it should be open source. If, if it's not open source, you, you should not run it on your computer. But then the next question will be like, how far are the developers to listen to my concerns? Another thing that is very dear to us is like recycle infrastructure. And this is, I tell you, like what counts for the foundation, for the Dynorg Foundation. We don't want to uh, have new hardware. We like to recycle hardware. We have like a file system encryption software that works still on 386 computers on Linux, Tomb. We have like all sorts of, uh, uh, Danny Bolic was like recycling uh, Xbox One game consoles to do your own radio on the internet. Uh, the game industry is producing so much waste, so much hardware, we should appropriate it and recycle it, and we believe in this. And the third thing is like uh, design for a distributed process. So in short, uh, um, yeah, be interdisciplinary, really cross your boundaries. So this is what we are about. We are around since 20 years, so of course we couldn't miss the worldwide sensation we are all here for. So we were in for the lulz, and uh, uh, yeah, it became also like quite some some, uh, some uh, community, society, and also sustainability dimension. So enough with the introduction. What I want to propose you is a uh, historical perspective that goes beyond ourselves as hackers from Dynorg. Uh, it touches into people from the 
this thing has a laser, right? No, but it's not visible. But anyway, this thing from the 80s, which is called the GNU project, what inspired Richard Stallman, the GNU project is now 40 years old, the, the free software movement, we owe a lot from this. Like the, the prototype era is where it uh, started, sort of, aesthetically. So the 80s, we had Kraftwerk music, we had 60s and 70s counterculture, very important to remember about this counterculture, which kept on through today. We are in a, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure about legal status, but yeah, tolerated, legalized, but squat. You know, we come from, many of us from squatted uh, places. So, uh, counterculture means to find a space where it's not given in society and, and grab it. The golden era back uh, in the 80s and 93 is when really the, the, the GNU project started, but also when Neuromancer was published, when the golden age of video games, Commodore, Atari, Blade Runner was, was published. So this sort of aesthetic, Chandler goes into cyberpunk, started taking place. Misguided secret services, uh, uh, we all started to know about Gladio here in Italy, about Sun Devil. We knew that the system was not telling the truth, was like mischievous. Then we, we had the WWW, the World Wide Web. So we had the first internet, I connected to the internet uh, in 94 uh, with a modem before there were BBSs. So a big change like real-time communication online. Mainstream era, these all went mainstream. Financial systems started using cybernetic systems. 93, 99, Time Magazine, Lawn Mover Man, very nice, uh, Johnny Mnemonic, Web Population Explosed, Microsoft Windows become the status quo as it is still today the most used operating system in the world on PC computers. Then we had the Millennium Era, 2000, 2010. I don't mention here there was a flash crash, so first uh, account of a, of a crash on the financial system that we don't know uh, uh, about uh, uh, or why, why it happened. Then we had like uh, uh, the George Bush era, 9-11 attacks, like a total disaster, the Holocaust of privacy all over the world, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, DRM developed and hacked and developed and hacked and still like, you know, digital restrictions management systems. Uh, so yeah, like the TPM started, Palladium if you ever heard about, people wanted to tell us what to run on our computers. So fundamental betrayal of liberties, like I buy it, no strings attached. Why should you tell me what to run on it? So Google come in, web 2.0 shields all over, spam, botnets, viruses, RFID started taking place, global surveillance everywhere and data mining started to be a real, a real business. So where we are now, the crypto era, is probably almost finished. We are entering probably a new era, but it started around the 2010, 2011. It's not a coincidence that two projects really are uh, reaching a cue point I will talk about in this era. And it's by now, pervasive computer, human rights prevarications everywhere, just like painted with, you know, washed into a nice web 2.0 uh, uh, packaging, but basically it's a human right prevarication, everything that is happening on social networks. Ethical hacking takes place into cyber, cyber security, advanced cryptography, so the field of cryptography and mathematics attracted me like very much. This was the year I started work as an applied cryptographer. It became very, very strong. We had enormous advances, if you think, like we were stuck at symmetric uh, key Diffie-Hellman and now we have like zero knowledge proof and homomorphic encryption behind the door. Bitcoin started, Wikileaks, very two important projects, Q projects, and a massive exodus from institutions to networks, what Eben Moglen used to call the, the disintermediation. Uh, the lack, we finally realized that institutions, centralized institutions, are not to be trusted. So we are shifting towards an ethic and a governance uh, that is driven by networks. So these are the images of these like excursions. We started with the cyberpunk, the, the RPG game, I don't know whom you, 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 uh, of you played it, also like the cyberpunk on Time magazine back in the 70s said virtual sex, smart drugs and synthetic rock and roll. They were like uh, uh, projecting the, the, the counterculture into the cyber dimension with all these vices, you know, these are puritanists. Anyway, who reads the time nowadays? Uh, Tads, Hakim Bey, fundamental uh, uh, book for oh, many of us, like also here in Rome where we are, like temporaneously autonomous zones, 
we had in Italy like many illustrators uh, that were really, really dear to all the decoder generation. Networking, there is a beautiful book if you want to know about what happened in Italy in those days by Tatiana Bazzichelli that you can download, of course it's for free. And then we have overall the ethics that Donna Haraway, one of the most important cyber feminists, there are many out there, taught us like do not refuse technologies just like be a hybrid accept it and hybridate because this is what feminism has done all these years and all these ages to survive also you know into the precarity and prevarication of society so two main tracks spawned of activism from this sort of uh, of, of history and historical track one, uh, you can recognize some symbols. You know, we had the lulz of uh, Anonymous, we had uh, like uh, op OPSEC, we had like hacks that were huge. People really counterattacked the establishment. They say, your systems do not work, even kids can break it. You know, we had judges that were really embarrassed because, you know, you have like a 16 year old, years old kid getting into a system that has uh, like 10 billions in cybersecurity and cops all over watching the system and a 16-year-old can make a hole into it, and the judge is told, oh, now you should send a 16-year-old to jail. Like, how about these people paid millions to keep the system secure? Like, what are they doing? Like, boomers or what? I don't know. I mean, the new generation sees, you know, like the sort of older boomer generation as utterly stupid. Maybe they're not wrong about this. So we had this sort of uh, new punk wave, and in my opinion, the Anonymous was the new punk. And now it's, it's old, like many of us became like older. I, mean, I was even too old for Anonymous. They were punk, I can tell you for one reason. If you were above 30 years old, they didn't believe in you. Well done, kids. <laughs> like, never be, it's a youth movement, you know? So they were like the real punks there. And also there was another track of this activism. There are two sides of the same medal. Is the ethical, the ethical movement that Richard Stallman and Eben Moglen created that now, just like a week ago, but actually this year, is 40 years old. Incredibly important. Eben Moglen, often forgotten, was a lawyer. Richard Stallman at the MIT, as a programmer, as a developer, a very talented one. They understood that it's ethical for software that, uh, that, that someone can run for any purpose this software, no strings attached, can study it and adapt it to his or her own needs, so also translation, also little modifications, redistributed and distributed modifications. Can you do business with this? Yes. If you don't know how, you're missing the train because Red Hat was acquired by IBM for 32 whopping billions in 2019. So this is a billion air business as well. But it doesn't matter uh, uh, how much money, now we are in crypto, like we have a lot of money flowing through it. What matters is the ethics of the system because uh, this is the point of all my talk today behind every corner, in every little town in the south of Italy, in the south of Africa, in the south of, uh, or in the north, uh, in Eskimese countries, in the middle of India, anywhere you go, like in, no matter how rural and, and peripheral it is, there may be a genius that needs freedom and tools to develop herself or himself. And we need to grant us as humanity this, this opportunity, this possibility. This is really openness. So I think this was the ethic. And it's not a chance, not a coincidence, that this man met this man. This was uh, back then at the, at the, at the, um, in the Ecuador embassy in London, holding the photo of another man that is risky, risked his life uh, uh, all these people and more risked their life and actually became martyrs as well because they really believed that the system didn't work and from inside took a step that is very dangerous for them. But it's an ethical step, like really trying to change the system. Somehow they managed, you know, like they, they even like moved parts, political parts of the systems towards their own, their own way, like uh, Julian Assange at the time of the cables, before the cables at the release of the, of the helicopter shot uh, shooting was actually awarded a CIA prize for integrity and intelligence. So this is not like a war to the system, but it's also a dialogue to the certain system, and the system sometimes is listening. What happened back then in 2011? 
this happened uh, in financial terms. It was like 2000, uh, January 2011, WikiLeaks financial blockade came. Helicopter shot all over the world. We had it everywhere, in the Netherlands, in Italy. We had like this uh, helicopter from the US Army shooting Reuters journalists in the streets of Baghdad. So when this was released, it was a big, big thing. And WikiLeaks started having a lot of uh, inflow of donations all over the world. This was a really big release on which some of the early and, and good members of WikiLeaks also uh, uh, converged. The Forbes article about Bitcoin came out on 9 of May 2011. In the middle of this, you see the quantity, the volume of transactions growing and, and also the, the value of Bitcoin growing because Wikileaks was cut from Visa and MasterCard from receiving donations without a court order. The system show his face. There was no court order, no legal process. Some politicians at that time, the Republican Party, said, oh, these are enemies of the state, we must proceed by force. Cut off the pipes from the project. At that point, many, many hackers realized, okay, it's the time to switch because we don't believe into this system anymore. Can we do it? Can we not? We switched. So WikiLeaks started accepting uh, Bitcoin donations. The, the Bitcoin was popularized also by people in the US that understood they want to jump on the train. CIA at that time invited many of us Bitcoin developers, Bitcoin core developers at that time, into a conference back in, in, in uh, San, uh, San Diego uh, to, to talk. You know? Some people even went there. Like the system understood this was happening. First Bitcoin conference in Prague, it was November 2011. We had major parliamentaries, the first Swedish parliamentaries from the Pirate Party. We had all the attention from, you know, the new generations. Then Bitcoin theft, the first one, the big one from Bitcoinica, 43,000 Bitcoins stolen. Then second Bitcoin conference, London, September 2012. I met amazing people there. From there on, we had basically the shields flooding the world community. Like from there on, there was no, not any other Bitcoin conference I could go and I could recognize the original people. They were all marketing people, completely unrelated, flooding the financial space because they were financial operators. That's all right, it happens. But what happened is that Wikileaks has kicked the hornet's nest. These are Satoshi's words. His last message on the Bitcoin forum and the swarm is headed towards us. Satoshi disappeared after this message. He understood, or she, or them, or they, understood that this was really happening and didn't want it to hold the heat. I think it was wise because they left an empty throne on which we are all somehow sitting, and it's a very good attitude to not take also like the lead of this. And yeah, PC World, could the WikiLeaks scandal lead to new virtual currency? The, the totally visionary journalist, like, the 10 December 2010. Yes, it did. So, every time you look into an abyss, the abyss looks into you. Friedrich Nietzsche, that's what happened. So we had uh, one of the first blocks of the Bitcoin blockchain inscribed by Dan Kaminsky. I like to remember him, uh, unfortunately left us some years ago. And uh, yeah, he just inscribed uh, the ASCII portrait of Len Sassaman, the author of the first mix master of emails, uh, and, uh, yeah, also Aski Bernanke at that time was a chief of the central bank. So we had, uh, uh, we have this as if you look into, uh, into the very first uh, uh, blocks of Bitcoin, you will find this inscribed thing. And on the other side of the spectrum, in the business uh, side, uh, the business people started understanding that open source ethics is actually to be digged. It's a good way to go. Google made a fortune, Facebook made a fortune with that because you can tell, you know, about their mission, I don't share their mission, but the way they work internally or at least they started building a corporate culture, it was completely predating the hacker culture that we have because they know that openness, transparency, passion, curiosity, sharing, it was the way to go. And now they have offices in which people don't do war between desks but actually collaborate much more and, uh, you know, there is a sort of uh, dimension. Also, we have like this new phenomenon, also in business, of paresia. You know, sometimes someone will uh, just say everything that happens and will go and leak something, whether it is for a leaking or for, you know, like uh, starting to, to, to leak out some secrets. 
because there is no security through obscurity. And we know, even if we work into a big company, that if the big company makes secrets out of its known vulnerabilities, someone anywhere in a little town sometimes, probably a 16 years old kid, uh, not to be blamed for it, will find that hole and will get through it. So there is no security through obscurity. You cannot hide and be secure because we are many <laughs> looking at these things. And rough consensus and running code, also a sort of revolution in governance of companies, which today is branded as agile. Agile development is great. You make your own way uh, through it. I mean, we work at Dine through agile very well. So what happened is that we forked. We forked everywhere. We just like became the status quo right now. And I think it's important to see it because crypto is just another phenomenon of this. Like we actually took over the whole financial world. And it doesn't matter if it's a bear market or not. It matters that uh, we provide a system that banks are, were the only one providing before. And now people do not need those banks to write a number into a database. They can hold their value. This is huge. So banks are becoming only KYC operators, AML operators. They are changing completely their role. So this is the real thing we cannot go back from. Eventually, they will try to emit you know, their own crypto money, but then the decentralized architecture will step in. So what are the next challenges? And I conclude with a hint what I think we have in front as a fight for us as activists. Again, because we must be ready to fight with our own uh, ways. I go back to one experience that has really like, uh, is, is very dear to me. It was my entry into the city of Amsterdam, where I live. It was the ASCII squatted uh, social center. It was 2005, this was Javastrat in the host of Amsterdam, and we squatted uh, abandoned places and we built an internet cafe inside. So we had shifts, we didn't leave. We also squatted a lot of other places for living ourselves. We had fantastic houses. But this we squatted for the populace. And we had like, this was like the most migrant place in Amsterdam. We had people walking in, like, can I print this? Can I use the computer? We had terminals in Arabic with other kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, alphabets. We had access to email and basic access to printing and email. No alcohol, we served some tea, we tried to be friendly to everyone, and we ran shifts into this place. We squatted it, we had people trying to evict us. As you see, we know how to solder metal bars. We got gigs into also like the physical hacking. And so we resisted a lot, like the ASCII was an experience 10 years old. What was the point of the ASCII? Internet was not free at that time. You had to pay for it, you had to give your ID for it. Many people had struggles. Not everyone had the internet everywhere. So we thought that internet was a right before the UN had to declare it. We knew it. So we squatted for it and we gave it to people. And this was uh, because we believe that people really need access to what is happening around them, also in the digital space, and they need to learn more about these tools. So I'm getting to my point here. The other side of the industry does something else to us. They just want us to like. They just want us to express our desires, our needs, to profile us. They extract things from us, but they don't let us understand how they do it, what they do with it. It's completely proprietary stack. And soon is coming an AI to guide it. And they are entering the same verticals where we are. The financial sector will use AIs to establish the credit of people. The insurance sector will use AI to establish the liability of an insurance. So, these sort of technologies are entering completely like all verticals, and what they do is they try to have machines understand people faster than we understand machines. So I get to my fundamental question, which I think an activist point is for tomorrow, is what are we developing for? For machines to understand humans, or for humans to understand machines? Many people say it on this stage already. I heard Kiran saying it, I heard Eleanor saying it, education is important, that people understand what machines do is important. And the next fight will be between deterministic systems, what we are building with crypto, and non-deterministic systems, what they are building with AI, because there is no way you can actually hold accountable an AI for what is doing. 
And I can assure you, AIs will commit crimes. Thank you.